All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, I think we'll get started. We're still missing a bunch of people, but uh, um, I have a lot of information to um, to present to you today. Uh, so I prefer to get started. So thank you so much for joining in this webinar on how to identify sick and cavity nesting birds. Very much appreciate you being here. Um, I'm Ian Fife. Uh, I am the Forest Birds Program Coordinator with Birds Canada. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit of house cleaning uh, just before we get started. So uh, on the um, on my right, anyway, on my right side, you should have a uh, uh, a menu box, and there should be an audio. So if you're having trouble hearing me at the moment, um, you may need to um, fool around with uh, with that uh, with the audio. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me just fine. There, the other option. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, the screenshot option. So uh, depending on the device that you are using, you'll have a different uh, you'll have a different way to do screenshots. I do encourage you to take screenshots of any of the slides that show up. Um, I will be moving. There's a lot of information on these slides. I try to keep it as user friendly as possible, but uh, I do move through the 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 information rather quickly. Uh, because, like I said, there's a lot of information there, so feel free to take advantage of that of that uh, screenshot option. Um, the other thing is the question box as well. Uh, feel free to add a comment or question in the chat box at any time during the presentation. I'll go through the comments and questions at the end of each segment, so I'll be separating them out between cavity and stick nesters. Uh, and at the end of the cavity nest, I'll I'll discuss. Uh, I'll go through questions about cavity nesters and 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 this and likewise for stick nesters. So uh, I will not be monitoring that uh, chat box while I'm speaking today. So I do encourage people to respond to any questions or comments if someone is looking for clarification about something that I've said and uh, it doesn't and I and it may not be intuitive to everyone. So. We'll move forward here. So uh, just a little bit about me. So I'm an avian ecologist with an interest in human and bird interactions. Uh, as an ecologist, I'm especially interested in how, um, how and why birds choose the habitat that they do. I have about 15 years of field experience working primarily with birds throughout North America in ecosystems ranging from the Arctic to the prairies and now the Carolinian forests as the uh, program coordinator for the Ontario Forest Birds Program. Uh, so in this position, we monitor populations of four of Canada's most at-risk birds in the Carolinian region of southern Ontario. Uh, these birds are the Acadian flycatcher, the cerulean warbler, the Louisiana water thrush, and the protonotary warbler. Our work includes completing extensive population and habitat surveys for these species. Uh, another important aspect uh, to this position is building and maintaining relationships with private and public organizations such as the Ontario Woodlot Association. So the importance of collecting this information guides us to aid in decision making regarding bird conservation and habitat management. And as an avian ecologist, I see the bird's habitat as the most important function to ensure the success of the species. And so it's important to understand and be able to provide that information to ensure good land stewardship, especially concerning species at risk. I think the most relevant experience I have with respect to my knowledge about identifying bird nests are the two and a half years I spent at Trent University as a master's student. Uh, there, I studied incidental take of forest birds by forestry activity. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the term incidental take, it refers to the inadvertent injuring or killing of a bird uh, and or the damaging or destruction of a bird's nest or eggs through some human activity. And in the case of my study, that meant forestry activity. So I spent two years searching for and monitoring as many bird nests as possible to determine how many nests had been destroyed by this activity or if forestry activity had an impact on an adult's pair ability to, ability to successfully complete the breeding process. So over the two years, I was able to successfully find and monitor over 400 bird nests. Uh, additionally, my current position has me looking for and monitoring species of risk uh, a species at risk nest and determine how productive they are each year. All right, that's uh, enough about me. Um, I'm just going to stop uh, 
sharing my webcam uh, to avoid the, the distraction as well. I'm sure most of you don't want my photo in your screenshots, so I will turn off my webcam now. All right, so I'm hoping this webinar will be informative and instructive, whether you're here out of general interest or just want to help, uh, or just want to help you become a, a better steward for your woodlots. Uh, being that it is a heavily instructive and information-based webinar, I hope I don't come across uh, too monotonic or robotic. This is my third time, so I'm hoping I, I, uh, I hope I have got, worked those kinks out anyway. Uh, but the webinar is repetitive in its structure, uh, and that's just to maintain some consistency between the bird species, uh, and hopefully it's easier for, uh, for all of you to retain some of the information as well. Um, the OWA and I will work to put the webinar up on uh, the OWA website or their, and their YouTube, YouTube channel. Um, uh, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that I tried to keep the information on the slides as easy to understand as possible. In some cases, there are there there is a lot of information on one slide. Uh, I tried to keep the text down as much as much as I could, but um, again, yeah, feel free to use that that screenshot option that I mentioned. All right. Uh, so for this webinar, I'll go through some key bird identification features and then I'll follow either by ways to identify the bird through some of their behaviors or a comparison to a similar species, or I'll just provide some interesting fact about that bird. Uh, I'll follow the bird ID up with breeding periods for each species, specifically for Ontario. Uh, and that information was based off of data collected by citizen scientists for Project Nestwatch. And then I'll follow the breeding period information up by discussing some of the preferred nesting habitat for each species and finally how to identify their cavity and or stick nests. I'll allot about five to ten minutes of questions between each segment and then I'll finish the talk off with a short demonstration of the OWA Nature Counts portal where uh, OWA members can input species occurrences and nest data that can be used for their own property or woodlot. Um, and Birds Canada can use this for bird conservation uh, research. Um, there may be some people here participating that are not OWA members, but the Nature Counts portal does have uh, other interesting bird-related projects that everyone can become a part of. I do encourage you to go to the uh, Birds Canada website and look at volunteer opportunities there if you want to become more involved with uh, bird conservation. So we'll start, like I mentioned, we'll start this uh, webinar off with four cavity nesters. It's not an exhaustive list of cavity species. I tried to focus on common species you'd find in your woodlot or forest, uh, as well as um, I also included a, a very important uh, species at risk. All right, uh, so let's jump right into it. So we have the pileated woodpecker is our first one. It's the largest woodpecker in North, North America. It's most easily identified by its bright red crest and the, and the striped black and white head. Males have a red mustache uh, directly behind their bill and the females don't have that mustache. Uh, their body is dull and completely black. In flight overhead, the pileated woodpecker can be identified by their large white body and white, uh, but sorry, um, can be identified by their large body and their white underwings near the the front edge of, of both those wings. Another way you can identify pileated woodpecker and really woodpeckers in general is their flight pattern. Uh, pileated woodpeckers specifically are strong flyers with a slight undulating flight pattern. It's rather slow, but it's vigorous and direct. Uh, and given their large body size and this and this type of flight pattern, they're, they can be relatively easy to identify if you get a good look at them. Uh, so pictured here is the annual cycle for pileated woodpeckers. I'll show the same graphic for all species I'll talk about today. Uh, the circle displays the months of the year on the outside and then three inner circles each with a different shade of blue. So the outer dark uh, blue circle shows migration periods for each species. In this case, uh, it would be for pileated woodpeckers and you can see that there's no migratory period for pileated woodpeckers. They're a non-migratory species and that just means they stick around all winter. 
So the lightest blue on the inside uh, refers to the species molting periods, but I won't be getting into any molting periods during this webinar. Uh, the one we'll really be focusing on is the, the center, the center blue circle, the, the second inner circle, and that shows the breeding period with two black bars, the two black bars there indicating the egg laying and young stages. So the outer black bar, that's the egg laying and incubation stage which for pileated woodpecker begins in early May and goes to mid-June. And with the peak egg stage indicated by uh, the thickness of the bar goes from mid-May to early June. Uh, a couple of terms I'd like to define before moving on here is, uh, because I'll be using them throughout the, we uh, the, the webinar, are nestlings and fledglings. So a nestling is a young bird that has just hatched from the egg and is completely dependent on, its, uh, on the adult. So uh, in other words, it can't feed itself, it can't walk, and it certainly can't fly. And that's until the point where it begins to grow adult-like feathers. So once they start growing, or once they've grown those feathers and become strong enough to move independently in the nest, and they start beginning, and they begin to start stretching their wings, that's when they become fledglings, at which point they are usually ready to leave the nest within a week or so, and that just depends on the species. So the pileated woodpecker nestlings hatch in the nest starting in mid-May and that extends to uh, mid-July, uh, where all, um, all nesting for Kalibu woodpecker would be done in mid-July. And then the peak, uh, the peak time for, for the young, young stage is the month of June. So they most often nest in roofs and dead trees within mature stand of either coniferous or deciduous trees. Uh, roost sites are typically in dead trees that have multiple cavities, like the one pictured here on the right. Uh, the multiple cavities give roosting adults uh, an opportunity to escape a predator, and roost sites are excavated throughout all seasons. The uh, young pileated woodpecker use large diameter live trees to roost until they locate a cavity, and that's usually about a week after they've left their natal cavity. Uh, nest trees are typically in dead or deteriorating live trees and within a mature or late successional stand of coniferous, deciduous, or mixed trees. Uh, both males and females excavate the cavity. The entrance holes are large and oblong and that makes them very distinct from other woodpeckers hole, woodpecker holes which are round. The cavity holes are 9 to 12 centimeters in, uh, vertical and about 8 to 9 centimeters wide. The tree diameter uh, of the cavity tree ranges from 45 to 100 centimeters diameter at breast height, with the average tree diameter around 60 centimeters. Uh, the cavity heights are usually uh, are found anywhere in the range of 13 to 20 meters. But, um, I won't be there. Won't be any kind of smooth transition here. Uh, it's just jumping from species to species. Like I said, there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about. So I'm just going right through. So. So uh, here we have the red-headed woodpecker. It's a very distinct looking woodpecker with that velvet red head, uh, the black back and these large white wing patches with the white belly. The males and females are monomorphic, meaning they are indistinguishable. You can't tell them apart. So while in flight, those large white wing patches become even, even more apparent. And they have a distinct flying feature. So during the breeding season, they are actually aerial insectivores that sally from a branch to catch insects. So that means they will be perched on a branch. Uh, they will fly out to catch an insect and then return to the same branch to eat its meal. Uh, so they are one of the few woodpeckers in the world that, that actually fly catch for their food. So they begin laying eggs in early May, and they'll continue to incubate eggs until mid-August in the southern portions of the range. However, in Ontario, they're usually finished incubating by mid-July. Uh, the young begin to hatch in early June, and the young will have fledged the nest by early August. So red-headed woodpecker are actually considered oak savanna specialists in the northern U.S. They have a strong preference for these for large open areas with short vegetation. Uh, presumably, they've adapted this habitat from their ability to catch insects in flight. So in Canada, the oak savanna habitat is a limited ecosystem, so um, uh, they, choose, they often choose other habitats such as uh, beaver meadows, like the one pictured here on the right, um, forest edges adjacent to farms and orchard fields, and where they can also feed on crops and fruit there. 
Um, and they'll also nest in human altered habitat that reflects their that preferred oak savanna habitat. So uh, that that picture on the left, you can see it really, you could imagine that looks like a golf course or a public park or a cemetery. And, and that's actually a, some habitat that red-headed woodpeckers do prefer. So they they will occupy interior forests as long as you uh, as long as there has been an open gap either created or uh, naturally created, um, uh, and and it also has to be coupled with snags and or dead branches. And so um, the dead wood is very important for red-headed woodpeckers, uh, not just for cavity excavation, but for the roosting, perching, and feeding. Uh, they are weak, uh, weak primary excavators, so the more decayed the wood is, the better. Uh, the cavities are excavated in dead trees or dead parts of live trees. Uh, more often than not, however, uh, the cavity trees are snags that have lost most of their bark. Uh, and they most often nest in deciduous woodlots, but will excavate in pine if the right habitat is available. Uh, mass trees are also very important for fall caching, so a forest composition that includes oaks, beech, and hickory are enticing for red-headed woodpeckers. Uh, their cavity diameter is about 6 centimeters, and the height of the cavity can range anywhere from 5 to 12 meters. Uh, the diameter of the tree can be anywhere from 30 to 80 centimeters diameter at breast height, so mature stands are important for red-headed woodpecker. As I mentioned, dead wood is important, so at the nest site there has to be at least one to three snags in the immediate vicinity of the nest, um, along with that open open area, that savanna-like habitat. Um, um, these are all these snags uh, are all used for nesting, roosting, perching, and feeding from. So our smallest and most widespread woodpecker in North America is the downy woodpecker. The males have a red spot on the back of their head, and the females do not. They have a black and white striped head and white spots on their wings and have a thick vertical bar down the center of their back. Uh, their bellies are also completely white. Uh, the hairy woodpecker and downy woodpeckers are uh, sometimes confused. Uh, the markings on the two birds are, are very much the same. Uh, however, the hairy woodpecker is about twice the size of the downy woodpecker and they have this large, thick, stout, uh, long bill. Uh, so uh, the downy woodpecker is another non-migratory woodpecker. They begin laying their eggs in early April and continue incubating until the end of June. The young hatch as early as mid to late April and then will fledge, um, oh, will fledge from the nest in late July. So cavities are constructed on the underside of a leaning dead stub of a living or dead tree in the advanced stages of heart rot. Uh, the cavities are excavated. Uh, the cavities are also excavated in trees that are infected with a fungus, and that just makes the wood easier to easier to excavate. Uh, the nests are found in relatively open areas. The diameter of the cavity tree ranges from 15 to 60 centimeters diameter at breast height, and the cavity height ranges anywhere from 1 to 10 meters. Um, cavity holes are small. Uh, um, and are about three to four centimeters in diameter. Uh, one of our more recognizable birds is the black-capped chickadee. It's a small, compact bird. Males and females are also monomorphic. Uh, they, their heads have a black cap and bib, and they have uh, white cheeks. Uh, they have a gray back with a long gray tail, uh, buffy colored sides with a white belly. Uh, they are quite willing to feed from your hands and are very curious and brave for being such a tiny bird. So they will begin laying eggs in early April and continue to incubate through to mid-July. Uh, the young, young hatch as early as the beginning of May uh, and fledge from the nest in late July. Uh, they often nest in birch and alder trees, um, and they excavate their own nest in dead snags or rotten branches. Uh, chickadees will use nest boxes, but they prefer to excavate their uh, they prefer to excavate wood shavings over using an empty box. The uh, nest trees average about 20 centimeters in diameter, 
and the cavity height can range from uh, ground level all the way up to 20 meters, but most cavities are in the one to 70 meter height range. Our next species is the white-breasted nuthatch. Males have a black crown, females have a grayish crown. Uh, beyond that, the males and females uh, are identical. Uh, both sexes have a white face and breast with a bluish gray back. Uh, the feathers under their tail and their sides have a rusty tinge, but the intensity of this color may vary, and their bill is slightly upturned. Uh, the white-breasted nuthatch, or nuthatches in general, are known for walking downward on large branches and tree trunks, and the advantage to this behavior is to search for prey and uh, by, pro uh, by probing uh, bark crevices and loose bark. So the white-breasted nuthatch begins laying eggs in mid-April and incubate until early June. There is a very short young period where they begin hatching in late May and are fledged a month later in late June. Their preferred habitat is mature deciduous forests, but they can be found in mixed deciduous and coniferous woodlands and occasionally in residential areas. Uh, the white-breasted nuthatch are rare in spruce fir coniferous forests, and they, they seem to favor sugar maple, hickory, basswood, or birch forest compositions, and favor woodland edges over interior locations, uh, also where there are uh, open areas near the nest, so there are usually some some type of water or uh, roads, um, even clearings and fields. They mostly nest in deciduous trees and will occasionally build a nest in a coniferous tree, but it is very rare for them to do so. Uh, they use natural cavities or old woodpecker holes to build nests. They they may enlarge the existing hole, but they do not excavate the cavity on their own. They often reuse the cavities year after year, and the location of the cavity varies from five to 20 meters above the ground. Uh, and the cavity entrance can be anywhere from three to six centimeters in diameter, but the, it seems that the larger end of that range is often preferred. Um, the white-breasted nuthatch's cousin, the red-breasted nuthatch, have bluish gray back and wings with a distinct rufous cinnamon colored breast and belly. Uh, similar to the white-breasted nuthatch, the, uh, the red-breasted nuthatch males have a dark crown, whereas the females have a grayish crown. Uh, below that dark crown is a white eyebrow followed by a black eye stripe that extends from the base of their bill to the nape of their neck. And the male's, male's black eye stripe is generally darker and thicker. Um, there's a few ways to tell apart the, the white-breasted from the red-breasted nuthatch. Obviously, the red and, and white breast uh, are, are a giveaway, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the white-breasted nuthatch does have uh, that rufous or rusty-colored uh, underside of their, uh, near their belly, so um, they can be confused. So some other ways that you might be able to uh, ID or differentiate the two species are, first, the, uh, their backs. Uh, the white-breasted nuthatch has the the, uh, the bluish gray back, with, but their wings have these uh, black are black with these white edging, and then the the red-breasted nuthatch is pretty much a completely uh, a bluish gray back. Uh, another another way is to tell them apart is their head, and the red-breasted nuthatch has a alternating black and white head pattern, whereas the white-breasted nuthatch have a completely white head with a black crown. So the red-breasted nuthatch begin laying eggs in mid-April and continue incubating until mid-July. Uh, the young hatch at the beginning of May and will have fledged from the nest as late as early August. They prefer a mature or, and diverse coniferous forest, especially forests composed of pine, spruce, fir, uh, hemlock, and cedar. Uh, they are less frequently observed in stands of pure pine or hemlock. Uh, the, they will breed in a mixed forest, but, it's, they, but that, it still has to have a strong conifer composition. And when they do occur in those uh, mixed stands, they are often associated with poplar, aspen, and oak species. The eastern population of red-breasted nuthatch um, are a bit more tolerant of of mixed forest stands, and they will occur in a wider range of forest types, and that includes uh, pure pure coniferous stands. 
Um, uh, their preferred nesting trees are poplar and pine, however. So unlike the white-breasted nuthatch, the red-breasted nuthatch excavate their own cavities. Uh, the nest trees are more than completely dead, are more than likely completely dead or have a broken top, uh, and they are less likely to excavate cavities in dead parts of live trees. Um, trees with multiple cavities are a good indicator for red-breasted nuthatch. Uh, Two-thirds of their nesting trees have two or more cavities in them. The tree diameter ranges anywhere from a uh, wide range, 12 and a half to 112 centimeters diameter at breast height. Uh, and the nest height ranges from 1 to 32 meters above the ground. Uh, the cavity entrance is similar in size to, their, uh, to the right breast of nuthatch. It's very small, average is about 4 centimeters. The American kestrel is the smallest North American falcon at only 30 centimeters in length. Um, they're often referred to as sparrowhawks. Uh, they have a bluish gray crown and two black vertical stripes under their eyes. Uh, the sex can be determined most easily from the back. The males have a rufous colored back with bluish gray uh, wings with black spotting. Their tails are rufous colored with one large thick black bar at the end of the tail. Uh, females have a rufous colored back, wings, and tail with extensive black barring all over. Other ways to identify American kestrel are to check hydro wires while you're in your car. Uh, they are quite often hunting from hydro wires over agricultural fields, especially in the winter. Uh, another way to identify uh, kestrels are in flight. They show that typical falcon silhouette with these long, sharply tipped wings and a long, straight, narrow tail. So this, the extreme ends of the egg and young stages in this graphic here are likely for the southern portion of the range. Uh, in this part of the range, uh, kestrels begin laying eggs in early April and incubation is complete by early to mid-June. Nestlings can begin to hatch about a month later in early May and will fledge as late as early to mid-August. They are secondary cavity nesters, meaning they rely on natural or pre-existing cavities made by woodpeckers for nest building. They prefer cavities in large dead snags that have no uh, overhanging branches blocking above the cavity. Uh, the cavity trees are in open areas, but they will also nest at woodland edges. Uh, hunting perches near the nest are also very important for kestrels, and these can include uh, uh, dead branches or, or hydro wires. They readily accept nest boxes and will also nest in holes in buildings. Uh, at the natural and artificial cavity holes uh, average around seven centimeters. The tree height in natural cavities ranges from two to 20 meters, and a nest box height ranges from three to six meters. I imagine they probably use uh, um, they probably use the nest box that's higher than six meters. But uh, I don't think too many people want to want to place a nest box higher than six meters. Um, so the northern sawwet owls, uh, it's a very small owl at 18 to 22 centimeters. The only way to tell the difference between the male and female is in the hand, where the females are are slightly larger. The uh, sawwet owl have a large round brown head with no ear tufts. The crown and the back of the head are streaked with white, and they have a white V-shaped patch between these big, beautiful golden eyes. Uh, the adult's tail, wings, and back are brown with white spots, and their belly is white with thick brown stripes. Another very similar looking owl is the boreal owl. So the Salwet owl have white streaking on a brown head, whereas the boreal owl have white spotting on a brown head. The Salwet owl begin laying eggs in early March and then incubation ends uh, early June. Uh, the nestlings begin to hatch in early April and fledglings will have left the nest by the end of July. Uh, they will breed in nearly any forest type, but more often occupy coniferous forests near riparian areas. Uh, the nest sites are strongly correlated when the number of small mammals are high, which suggests that prey and nest cavities are the two limiting factors for uh, northern sawwet owls to occupy 
a simple area. Uh, they are secondary cavity nesters that most commonly occupy cavities excavated by pileated woodpecker as well as the northern flicker which is another north american woodpecker uh, because they are adaptable in their nesting preferences they will accept nest boxes however prefer natural cavities uh, the cavity entrance ranges from six to nine centimeters and the average height is two and a half to 13 meters Our next bird is the brown creeper. It's a small tree climbing bird with a brown back with extensive white streaking throughout uh, and that provides excellent camouflage against the tree. They have a white eyebrow with a long decurved bill and a long stiff tail that provides, uh, provides uh, support as they, as they move their way up the tree. Uh, the males and females are identical. The greatest feature of the brown creeper is the reaction when they're threatened. Um, they completely stop moving and lay flat against the tree and that makes them uh, nearly invisible against the bark. So uh, according to Ontario nest records, brown creepers begin laying eggs in late April and they'll continue to incubate until the end of June. Excuse me, once incubation starts, nestlings will hatch in 15 days and then begin uh, and begin hatching in early to mid-May. Uh, the young will have fledged from the nest in mid to late July. I'd also like to point out that the 15 the, the 15 day incubation period is a very short time period for for a bird. Uh, it's usually anywhere in the 20 to 30 day range. Uh, so a brown creeper's preferred habitat is late successional stages of coniferous mixed and deciduous forests and are especially common in undisturbed old growth stands. In northern hardwood forests, their abundance appears to be highest in old stands, dominated by sugar maple and yellow birch with balsam fir snags. Uh, brown creepers, they're technically not a cavity nester, but they do require similar habitat features as a cavity nester in that they need dead or dying trees for feeding and nesting. And the reason for that is that their nests are always built between the trunk and a loose piece of bark. So an adult will move in and out of the area multiple times before choosing it as a suitable nest site. Um, the type of tree is really not that important. It, they will nest in both deciduous and coniferous trees. Uh, it really just matters if that loose bark is there. Uh, their average diameter breast height uh, of the nest tree is around 25 centimeters and that their nest height ranges from one and a half to seven meters and the cavity holes or the cavity in quotation marks here are usually just barely wide enough for the for the adults to fit through our next owl is the barred owl it's a large gray brown owl that is visually distinct from other eastern north american owls they have a round head with no ear tufts and a well-defined facial disc with a dark brown outline. They have black eyes with a yellow bill. They have horizontal brown barring on their throat and these vertical elongated brown streaks on a white belly. And then their back, uh, their back and wings have, uh, are brown with uh, white barring throughout. Uh, the barred owls are increasing their range in North America, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there, it's hybridizing with the critically endangered spotted owl, and that's great, greatly affecting the recovery efforts for the spotted owl. However, in their eastern range, their numbers are declining due to the loss of old growth forests. The barred owl are a non-migratory owl. In Ontario, eggs are laid in early March and incubation takes place until mid to late May. The nestlings will hatch about a month after incubation begins and young will fledge from the nest another four to five weeks after hatching. And the, so the barred owls prefer mature and old forest habitat with a well-developed understory to nest. In Ontario, they're strongly associated with tall, unfragmented mixed wood forests and avoid young forests. Uh, the old forests provide nest sites, uh, lower, tree, uh, lower tree stem density, and that provides easier hunting opportunities, uh, a closed canopy, and that helps regulate their temperature as well as provides protection. Uh, the structural complexity of an old growth forest also provides a diversity of prey. 
Uh, some also suggest that the proximity of water is also important near nest sites. Uh, they are a secondary cavity nester. The pairs prospect nests a year before and select a site the following February to March. They reuse that natural cavity as long as they they'll reuse that natural cavity as long as it has not rotted out. There has been an account. There was one account I read about. They had recorded a barred owl pair reusing the same natural cavity for ten consecutive years. They uh, prefer larger, taller snags of any tree type. Uh, the nest tree diameter at breast height ranges from 47 to 60 centimeters, and the nest tree height itself ranges from 7 to 13 and a half meters. Uh, the barred owl are a good transitional bird for this webinar uh, because while they primarily nest in naturally formed cavities of deciduous and conifer snags, they also reuse stick nests built by hawks, crows, and ravens. Uh, so this ends the cavity nesting portion of this webinar. Uh, I'll leave this web address up for a second. Uh, feel free to write down or take a screenshot. Uh, I do suggest that if you are interested in placing nest boxes on your property, whether you're putting them up for, uh, in your woodlot or at your house, uh, I encourage you to visit this site. Uh, it tells you which common birds will accept nest boxes. Uh, it gives you plans on how to build those nest boxes, where to place the nest box, including the height. Uh, the proper habitat, and even the direction that the cavity hole should be facing. And so at this point, uh, I'll take five to ten minutes of questions about cavity nesting birds. Uh, feel free to type a question in the chat box. I'll do my best to answer them, um, after which I'll move on to the stick nesting birds. I would also like to preface to say that I, I'm not a forester, so if there's any kind of forestry-related questions, I'll, I, you know, I'll do my best to answer uh, in my experience and knowledge, but uh, uh, like I said, I'm not a forester, so I may have to uh, to um, um, skip the question. All right. Uh, let's see if we have any questions here. Oh. Um, a few questions. Yes. Uh, um, hi, Paul. How are you? <laughs> Um, <laughs> Paul, Paul Robertson is uh, telling he's glad to see my beautiful face. Well, thank you, Paul. I'm sorry I can't see yours, but soon, I hope. Uh, anyway, um, Richard Doucette is uh, asking, can a copy of the presentation be made available? Yeah, yes, uh, the, uh, the OWA and I will work to put it up on uh, YouTube channels and, and our YouTube channels and our website. Uh, so, and what I'll do is I've got everybody's email who registered, and so I'll just do one big, one big email with the link to to the that video. So everybody will be able to um, uh, have a copy of that pres of this presentation. Um, John McPherson is asking, or McPherson, sorry. Uh, I noticed that you did not include wood ducks, which we have in our forest in the spring, possibly because of the proximity to our large lake. Yes. No, I didn't include. Wood ducks, certainly a, a species I did kind of overlook in this presentation. Um, yeah, I, that's really all I can say about that, John, as I kind of did overlook uh, our, the duck species. Certainly could have included mergansers, I could have included uh, buffalo heads and, and golden eyes as well. Um, uh, but yes, uh, um, wood ducks are, are a good species I could have easily have thrown into the mix here. My apologies, John. Uh, Ron Reinholt, uh, are hairy woodpeckers cavity nesters as well? Yes, yes, they are cavity nesters as well. Um, similar habitat to the downy woodpecker. A uh, little bit larger, a um, little bit larger a cavity hole just because of the larger size of them. But yes, they are cavity nesters as well. Uh, Megan Sanderson, can you go over the difference once more between male and female? And sorry, just give me one second. Uh, male and female northern sawwood owls. Um, really, in terms of uh, viewing them uh, as you're hiking or, or bird watching or any kind of uh, active recreational activity, uh, there's no difference. You can't tell the difference between the two unless you have them in the hand. Um, I did some northern sawwood owl banding uh, uh, for many years, so the best way to to determine whether it's a male or female is to measure the, their wing length. And that's how you determine the difference between male and female northern solid owls. So it's 
it's really hard to differentiate um, by eye. Uh, barred owls in southern Ontario? Um, it's a good question, Neil. Uh, I would just, I'm just going to come back to this map here, um, and I hope you can see my my mouse, but you can notice that there's quite a big white space here uh, in southwestern Ontario. I'm sure they occur where the habitat is, pro uh, where the habitat may be there. Um, they do prefer old growth forests, and southwestern Ontario uh, does lack a lot of that type of habitat, um, as well as forest cover in general, especially as you go uh, more towards um, the far southwestern Ontario, towards uh, Chatham Kent uh, and the Essex regions. Um, so I've heard I've heard barred owls, but uh, I've heard barred owls even just uh, from my own property because I have uh, adjacent large adjacent woodlots uh, beside my property. Um, uh, so yes, they are here, uh, just not in great numbers as you can see by the by this map here. Um, Kelly Sue is asking if a secondary cavity, uh, a secondary nesting bird cannot find a suitable nest, do they skip breeding that year or would they make their own cavity? Um, uh, they wouldn't make their own cavity. Uh, I doubt they would skip. Uh, probably uh, the likelihood would be that they would, uh, they would probably find suitable, they would find let's say less than suitable habitat. So they would just go to whatever area, even though it's, um, even though it wouldn't be optimal habitat for that particular species, they will make do with either whatever's around or would just try and continue to try and find. It's usually the male, so in a migratory species, the males are usually the one that show up first. And so the males are here, um, if, especially if they're uh, uh, like a first year breeder, uh, they are, uh, obviously trying to find territory and are often and often choose um, uh, what we'll call like secondary habitat so it's not it's not the best habitat but it's it's gonna do for the year kind of thing until they get older get more mature where they can you know fight for a primary territory so normally they will find something it just may not be the best um, suited habitat for that for that bird um, Deborah Moore has asked, uh, do any of the species you discussed refuse to use or an old nest? Um, usually the primary, yeah, the primary cavity nesters will refuse an old nest. Um, or yeah, they won't use a secondary cavity. Sometimes they will. I shouldn't say that actually, not all species. Redheaded woodpecker in, in, in my, uh, uh, in this presentation will, will use a, a uh, uh, will be use a secondary cavity nest. Uh, but it, it's very rare that they do. Um, do they refuse to use an old nest? Mm. I, in some cases, I want to say yes. So they may come back to this. So most times they, most times birds will breed in the same area. So they come back to the same territory, the same, and try to establish that same territory as the previous year. Uh, they may, if the, the nest from the previous year is unsuccessful. They may find a different, uh, a different nest that may give them a better chance of being uh, productive and successful that year. So there is possibility. It may not be like refused, but just uh, you know, I'll I'll pick a different site because that one wasn't as good last year. Um, that that is quite common among birds. I hope that answers the question you're looking for. Um, Madeline Bray. Um, it's a lack of old growth forest. Probably I've seen them weirdly in Toronto. Yes, but urban environments are obviously not ideal. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm assuming you're referring to the barred owl. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, um, yes, they occur in Toronto. Um, and there's probably some in, 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 and like I said, I've heard them in southwestern Ontario, but certainly not in the, uh, the high abundance in, in, as they would in, in some of the other areas, uh, such as the, uh, you know, Algonquin Park type thing. Um, that's uh, that was my last question comment. So uh, if there's no other uh, if there's no other questions, I will move on to our uh, stick nesting birds. Um, I'd also actually now that I've finished up answering those questions, if there's something I don't know the answer to, I'll definitely 
I'll say I'm not 100% sure or I don't know the answer. Um, when I do that, I've been pretty good at, at uh, flagging that question and I will email you after the webinar is uh, completed with the correct answer. So, uh, you know, despite uh, I may give some improper information, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm giving you guys the correct information. So I will research that and, and answer it properly. Okay, so we'll move on to our stick nesting birds and how do I find, how to identify their nests now. Uh, you can see there's a couple species I have included side by side, and that's just because of their similar appearances. I'll discuss the two of them together when I'm talking about their appearances, but when, um, but when I'm discussing their nesting preferences, I'll separate them out. Uh, again, this isn't an exhaustive list of stick nesting species. I tried to select woodland stick nesters that occupy uh, different types of habitat, as well as stick nest sizes and uses. Um, so two birds that uh, most people are familiar with, uh, whether it's through symbolism in classic literature or you're spending lots of time outdoors, are the American crow and the common raven. So I'll describe the crow first, uh, and then I'll follow that up by describing uh, the, the raven. So the crow, it's a medium-sized bird. They have a completely black head, body, wings, and bill. The crow feathers have a glossy uh, violet iridescence to them, and their tails have a slight, are slightly rounded. Uh, the raven, at just over two feet in length, and weighing around seven to 1,500 grams, uh, it's a very large bird in the corvid family. They are also entirely black, but they're more uh, glossy black, and they have long pointed wings and a wedge-shaped tail. So the features uh, to best use to tell the difference between the crow and the raven besides their size are features on the head. So the crow, they have a stout bill with bristly feathers near the base of the bill, and they have uniform feathers over the head, nape, and throat. On the other hand, the ravens, they have a large chisel-like bill with nasal bristles that covers about half of their upper bill. Um, their throat has elongated feathers uh, they, that are called hackles. And these are especially prominent on males uh, when they erect, they erect the hackles during their dominance displays. So another way to tell the crow and the raven apart are their voices. The crow make that distinct caw sound uh, compared to a deeper croak of a, of a raven. All right, so I'll start with the, the crow breeding, ha uh, breeding period, habitat, and nest site first, then I'll follow up describing the, those same features for the raven. So the crow will begin laying eggs in late March to early April. They'll incubate until mid, uh, to mid to late May. The nestlings hatch mid to late April, and the young will have fledged as late as mid to late June. The crow uses a wide range of nesting habitats. Uh, there are two main requirements for crows to occupy an area, and that's open areas and trees. Uh, they prefer open woodlots over dense forest tracks, and they use a wide range of uh, conifer and deciduous tree species. Uh, and they'll also use shrubs to nest. So the crow uh, uses medium-sized sticks uh, to build their nests, and right before laying, they will line the nest with uh, finer materials such as grass, moss, lichen, animal hair, and bark. Their nests are usually well hidden in the crotches and on horizontal limbs of trees and shrubs, but usually near the trunk. The, they are more likely to build their nests in the upper one-third to one-quarter than at lower levels. However, uh, the, nest height, uh, the nest height can vary and range from as low as a half meter above the ground to 26 meters high, and the average height of the nest tree um, is around, uh, or ranges from uh, ranges from uh, 11 meters to uh, 30 meters. Uh, the crow, it, it nests average about 50 centimeters in diameter, uh, or, it's, or about one and a half feet wide. All right, so we'll move on to the, the, the ravens, breeding periods, habitat, and, and nest features. So the, the common raven are uh, circumpolar, meaning they are distributed across the world in the Northern Hemisphere. So there is a lot of geographic and environmental variation in their breeding season. 
Uh, so I will do my best to provide information for Ontario. So most egg laying begins in early March uh, to mid-April and incubation is completed by mid-May to mid-June. Uh, the nestlings are beginning to hatch in mid-April to mid-May and the young will have fledged from the nest from mid-June to mid-July. Ravens are extreme habitat generalists. Uh, throughout their range, uh, because they are circumpolar, they will breed in forests, open coasts, mountains, deserts, tundra, and they'll even nest in Arctic ice flows. Uh, they're very, they can be tolerant to humans. However, in forested areas, they'll, they'll choose wilderness and uh, avoid human activities. Uh, they nest in conifer and deciduous forests in the middle latitudes, and they reuse their nests uh, uh, they reuse their nest site in sequential years and will continue to use it for many years. Nest construction begins with the male bringing sticks to the nest site and the feed and the female is the one that does most of the construction. The nests are usually close to the top but will have a little bit of canopy cover covering the nest. The lar and, uh, lar there's large sticks about a meter long and uh, ranging in diameter from 3 to 25 millimeters. Uh, and they're used for the base of the nest, and uh, they find them from uh, they find them by breaking them off of living uh, living plants, or they take them from old nests and then they place them loosely in the crotch of the tree, like the, the photo on the left there. Um, well, both photos are here. So, uh, so smaller sticks are then used to to weave and form the cup of the nest, and then the bottom of the cup where the eggs will be incubated. That will be lined with mud or fur from species of animals from shredded bark or hen grasses. So the base of the common raven nest measures 40 to 153 centimeters in diameter, and it's 20 to 60 centimeters high. And the nest height ranges from five to 30 meters. Our next species is the red-tailed hawk. It's one of our most widespread hawks and uh, most common birds of prey in North America. It occupies habitat from Alaska all the way south to Venezuela. Uh, very similar in shape and size to other related hawks, but it's most distinguished by the by its reddish tail with the dark band at the, near the tip. It's most often seen in flight. Um, the red tail can even be seen while it's in flight um, through its white underside. They can also be ID'd in flight with the dark shoulder markings and their dark wing tips. Um, some individuals will have a dark band that reaches across their belly, but this varies among individuals, and so it isn't really the most reliable way to identify red-tailed hawk. Uh, the reason for that is there are 14 recognized subspecies of red-tailed hawk throughout their range, and they all vary in appearance depending on their location. Uh, on top of that, they are diff there are color differences within those subspecies. So, for example, the red-tailed hawk subspecies most commonly found in Ontario is Buteo jamaicensis calaris. It has three different color morphs, a light, an intermediate, and a dark color morph. Uh, these colors also don't include juvenile plumages. So, I won't go into further detail here, uh, but a good Eastern North American bird ID book, such as Sibley's or National Geographic, should have uh, all of these different color morphs and juveniles for better, for better comparison. In fact, uh, the Sibley's book, it has an entire two pages dedicated, um, or for, sorry, for an, Eastern, uh, for an Eastern North America Sibley's book, they have an entire two pages dedicated just to all the different red-tailed hawk um, um, uh, color ranges or color differences. And that includes the juveniles as well. So in Ontario, nest building can begin as early as late February to early March. The eggs are typically laid in mid-March and will continue to incubate until mid-June to mid-July. The nestlings will hatch as early as early April and all young will have fledged by early August. Uh, generally, the red-tailed hawk breeds in open to semi-open habitats, which include mature forests of mixed conifer and deciduous trees. Uh, near grass and shrublands, as well as agricultural landscapes, but, and prefer to avoid dense forests. In Ontario, especially southern Ontario, the nests will usually be located uh, in a woodlot, near a woodlot edge next to a crop or pasture field. 
both the male and female uh, will either build a new nest or they'll refurbish a previous year's nest. Um, the nest will be uh, the nest will be reused for one or more years. They'll sometimes vacate the nest for one or more years, um, and then they'll pick up that nest again and use it again. So during, however, during nest construction, uh, the, the pair are very suspicious. Uh, human presence can cause them to uh, abandon the nest site. So if you're out, uh, if you're out in your woodlot or if you're out uh, uh, doing some recreational activity, you come across a red-tailed hawk building a nest. Please be mindful. Uh, please, you know, observe briefly, but uh, and keep a good distance uh, and keep moving through the area. So the nests are constructed from sticks about one to two centimeters in diameter, and the nest is lined with strips of bark, um, deciduous and conifer sprigs, poplar catkins, and other fine material. Uh, the nest sites are in elevated areas, usually in the crown of tall trees, and nests are found to range about 12 to 18 meters high. The nests themselves are about 70 to 75 centimeters in diameter, or just over two feet. So these are very two very similar looking hawks, and so the best way to identify them is by size. Uh, the sharp-shinned hawk is a slightly smaller uh, hawk at about 10 to 14 inches, and it's about the size of a blue jay or a mourning dove. The cooper's hawk, on the other hand, it's about 15 to 20 cent uh, inches in length. Uh, and about the size of a crow. Uh, when perched, the sharp-shinned hawk has a smaller head and maintain, always maintains that rounded head shape that you see in the photo there. The cooper's hawk will raise its head feathers and make it appear as though it has a crown on its head. That's not, uh, obviously, that's not the most ideal way to, to identify it, but it is a helpful feature. So another way to tell them apart uh, while they're perched is by their tails. So the sharp-shinned hawk has a, a squarish tail and it has this notch in the center where the two ends meet. Uh, the cooper's hawk, it has a long rounded tail relative to its body size. Um, and it also has a thick white band uh, at the end of the tail uh, and there's no notch there as well. Uh, so the cooper's hawk and sharp-shinned hawk are, are occipiters. They're in a group of birds called occipiters. And this is a type of hawk that primarily feeds on other birds. 90% of their diet consists of birds, and their prey capture rate, uh, their prey capture success rate can be as high as 50%. Uh, Occipiters have short, powerful wings and a long tail, and that gives them excellent maneuverability for foraging and chasing prey through structurally complex environments like woodlots, which make them formidable predators. Uh, there are only three occipiters in North America, and that's uh, these two here, the sharp shinned and cooper's hawk, as well as the northern goshawk. Um, the cooper's hawk will take small to medium-sized birds and sometimes some mammals, whereas the sharp shinned hawk, take, uh, because of their smaller size, they took the smaller songbirds, and on rare occasions uh, will take a bird the size of a robin. Uh, some other secondary food items for sharp shinned hawk are small mammals, frogs, and insects. So from here, I'll talk about Cooper's hawk uh, breeding period, habitat, and nesting process, and, and follow that up with the sharp shinned. So the earliest Cooper hawk eggs are laid early April, and incubation extends to late May. The earliest, uh, sorry, the nestlings begin to hatch in early May, and all, all young will have fledged the, the nest by late July to early August. Um, they, they, uh, Cooper's hawk uh, occupy deciduous, mixed, and coniferous forests, as well as deciduous riparian habitat. Uh, they are tolerant to human disturbance and fragmentation, uh, and along with more people putting up bird feeders, this has made them one of the more most populous hawks in, in hawk species in North America. Um, Woodlots tend to need tend to need to be at least four hectares. Uh, with mature trees and an average basal area of 30.9 square meters per hectare. Uh, they also prefer a nest site with a large amount of canopy cover to protect the nest against weather and predation. Uh, and pine plantations are also, can also be important for Cooper's hawk. Uh, most important factor for nest site selection of uh, Cooper's hawk is prey abundance, as well as the historic nesting success. So in other words, how successful the nest was the previous year. Uh, and another important feature is the complex vegetative structure of the woodlot. So males do most of the stick collecting and place it at the nest site. 
the females watch the process and will later use uh, use the uh, where the sticks have been collected as a feeding platform before they start laying their eggs. Uh, their nests are built with smaller sticks and finished off by lining the cup with uh, nests uh, with bark flakes and rimmed with fresh green tree sprigs. Uh, the average nest height ranges between 8 to 15 meters and the average nest tree diameter is about 20 to 50 centimeters diameter at breast height. Uh, nests that are built in coniferous forests are broader and flatter than nests in deciduous forests. So those coniferous forest nests are 64 to 76 centimeters in diameter and about 15 to 20 centimeters high, whereas the nests built in deciduous forests are about 61 centimeters in diameter and 43 centimeters high. So we'll move on to the sharp shinned hawk now. So the earliest uh, the earliest sharp shin hawk eggs are laid mid-April and incubation will extend until mid to late July. The, uh, the earliest nestlings hatch in mid-May and all young will have fledged by early to mid-August. So they will occupy mixed, and, uh, mixed conifer and conifer deciduous forests that have a relatively dense stand. So those stand age ranges from 30, from 30 to 100 years old. Uh, the, conifers, the conifers are most frequently used as nest trees, and sites are commonly uh, sites are commonly reoccupied, but nests uh, uh, sharp shinned hawk will rarely reuse uh, uh, previous year's nests. Um, they are a very secretive bird um, uh, when it comes to nest locations. Uh, nests are, are rarely found. Uh, most reports describe nest locations against the trunk or on horizontal limbs in dense, well-developed portions of the crown, well, uh, well below the top of the canopy. Uh, the nests are placed about two, two and a half to 20 meters high, and the nest tree diameter can range from 17 to 40 centimeters diameter at breast height. Uh, the nest itself is a platform made of small sticks about 35 to 60 centimeters wide and 10 to 20 centimeters high and it is lined with shredded bark and fresh greenery similar to what the Cooper hawk, uh, what the Cooper's hawk does. All right, so probably one of the species I don't really need to teach how to identify is the blue jay. Uh, I'll focus on some of the finer details here but, uh, that are often overlooked with common species like this. So their, their wing and tails are, have these, have a various shades of blue and they have these bold black uh, bars with white, uh, with white tips. They also have this black U-shaped collar across their upper breast and the side of their neck, and that joins a black eye line and, and borders the back of their head uh, and, and connects it behind their crest. Um, so I tried to find some interesting facts about blue jays. I came across this quote as it is a description from a, 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 an early European settler naturalist named Alexander Wilson. He's first describing a blue jay, and I just thought he really hit the nail on the head. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to read this quote here for you. It says, the blue jay it's dis is distinguished as a kind of bow among feathered tenants of our woods by the brilliance of his dress, and like most other coxcombs, makes himself still more conspicuous by his loquacity and the oddness of his tones and gestures. And so I, I really just needed to share that with you. I really appreciated the colorful description and the language used. So I, I just needed to, to share that. So I was, a, I was able to find uh, some interesting facts about blue jays nonetheless. Uh, they're monogamous birds. They don't really hold territories like most other birds, but they do, uh, they, but they do defend their nests quite readily. Uh, they are in the corvid, their corvid family of birds, so uh, related to crows and ravens. And they're extremely smart and social birds, and they will come together to, to mob predators as a, com as a community. Uh, so because of our latitudinal distribution, breeding times do vary. So in Ontario, the blue jay begins laying, egg, laying eggs in mid-April and continues to incubate into mid to late June. The nestlings will hatch early May and all young will have fledged by mid-July. They inhabit deciduous forests primarily, but they will also use coniferous and mixed forests, and especially woodlands with oaks and other large mass trees, and that's where they'll, they'll cache mass nuts uh, for the winter. They're often associated with woodland edges and utility rights of, or rights of way rather than deep forest habitat. Um, historically, the blue jay was not associated with urban areas in the Northeast, 
but over the last 100 years, they've adapted to humans, and of course, uh, the humans have provided more food to exploit, uh, as well as nesting, better nesting resources, um, and even better was uh, there are fewer predators, so their nesting success was much higher. Uh, they have shown to become, uh, blue jays have shown to become much more abundant after group selection cutting or uh, opening small gaps in a contiguous forest. Uh, their nests are constructed from strong, fresh sticks and sometimes dead sticks. The, uh, the sticks used to make the outer part of the nest are taken from live trees. Um, the stick size decreases near the cup of the nest and it's lined with, uh, the nest is lined with rootlets, dry and wet decomposing leaves, as well as birch bark, uh, moss and lichens, as well as grasses. Uh, the, the nest placement is highly variable. They pretty much put a nest anywhere in any tree species, but it rarely nests in shrubs. Uh, you can find a nest at the, the base all the way up to the top of the tree and on any part of the branch right at the end, uh, in the middle or near the trunk. Um, very generalist in terms of their selection. Um, although not common, they will reuse uh, nests the following year. Uh, the nest dimensions are about 17 to 20 centimeters in diameter and about 10 to 12 centimeters deep. Uh, so uh, the great blue heron is the largest North American heron, standing about 160 centimeters or one and a half meters tall. Uh, it's an e easily recognized bird. The, uh, the heron has a long tapered yellow bill. Uh, their neck and back are mostly bluish gray. Uh, their head is mostly white with a uh, with a thick blue stripe running from just above their eyes and extending to the back of their head finished off with a fine feathered crest behind the head. Uh, in flight, the, the heron hold their neck in a S shape and they fully extend their legs behind their body. And you can also identify herons by their flight pattern. They have these uh, very deep and slow wing beats. Uh, they will nest in single pairs, but most often they nest in colonies, often uh, commonly called rookeries or heronries. Uh, some colonies have over 500 active nests in them, and the largest heronry ever recorded had over 1,000 nests associated with it. Uh, heronries are protected in Ontario from disturbance during the breeding season, and usually a one-kilometer buffer around a heronry is established around the peripheral nests. So the heron, they begin laying eggs at the end of March and continue to incubate into late May to early June. The first nestlings will hatch mid-April and all young will have fledged by mid to late August. Uh, the, the great blue heron's occurrence is widespread. They are remarkably adaptable. Uh, during the breeding season, they forage in uh, uh, wherever there's water, in wetlands, water bodies, water courses, uh, all shapes and sizes. Uh, they can also be found in upland areas as well. Uh, they build their nests in trees and bushes and on the ground and on artificial structures, usually near water. They do prefer to nest in vegetation on islands or in swamps. Uh, heronries are strongly correlated to foraging opportunities and they'll continue and those heronries will continue to be reused as long as those resources are still available. Sticks are gathered by the male from wherever he can find them that includes on the ground and nearby trees and shrubs as well as stolen from abandoned nests of other stick nesting birds. Pardon me. Uh, the sticks are brought to the female and then she does the construction. They prefer to nest in trees, and nests are built in trees are approximately about 30 meters above the ground. Uh, the size of the nest varies uh, um, because new nests are, are, are a little bit smaller, obviously. They can be about a half a meter in diameter, uh, while the older nests, or the refurbished nests, are about 1 to 1.2 meters across and about a meter high. So the rose-breasted grosbeak, it's the only bird I'll be talking about today where the male and female have a markedly different uh, difference in appearance. Uh, it's a medium-sized finch. The male has a black and uh, the male has black and white uh, back and wings uh, and a white belly with this large pinkish red triangle on its breast and this large white bill. The female uh, is a little bit more camouflaged. She's olive brown with dark markings on her wings and back. Uh, she has a creamy colored belly with dark streaks and 
She has a her head is uh, pale, has a pale crown stripe as well as um, a white stripe above her eyes. Um, they have been uh, they have been considered both a pest and beneficial birds, especially by the agricultural community. Uh, they are considered a pest because they have they love um, tree buds and flowers, peas and fruit. Um, they were also considered beneficial because they eat beetles and scale insects and other insects that damage crops. Um, they are one of the few species in which the male and female sing. Uh, they the male and female also incubate the eggs and brood and feed the young at the nest. And they're also one of the only of they're also one of the few species that sing while they're singing sitting on the nest. Um, the pairs also communicate with each other. Males will, often, males will often sing briefly, and the female responds with a chink sound. And this is most often used um, to find uh, the male uses it most often to find the female as she's foraging. So the, the gross beak, they begin laying their eggs in mid-May and will uh, incubate in, in, until the end of, or until the mid-June. Uh, the nestlings begin hatching late May and all young will have fledged, uh, all young will have fledged by uh, late July. The gross beak occupies a wide variety of habitats in deciduous and mixed forests and are rarely found in coniferous forests. Uh, they prefer shrubby areas in, in mesic wet woodlands, swamp forests, and riparian corridors, and tends to avoid dry oak woodlands. They use open second growth woodlands in well vegetated areas and are rarely found in mature closed canopy woodlands. Uh, they often respond well to a uh, light strip and selection harvesting and are also found in woodlands that are uh, five to 15 years post harvest uh, that is allowed some vegetation to, to restore. Uh, the nest sites are in relatively open canopy or sub canopy. Uh, the, nests are, uh, the nests are preferred to be built in saplings over tall trees and they prefer deciduous over coniferous trees. Uh, they are built in trees found in, or sorry, the nest is built in trees uh, uh, in vertical forks or crotches of the tree, but they can also, they'll also um, nest in shrubs and vines. Uh, the nest is a very loose open cup, uh, open cup constructed of coarse sticks and twigs, and it's lined with decayed leaves, rootlets, and hairs. Uh, it's so loosely constructed that you can sometimes see the eggs from underneath the nest. Although it appears flimsy, the the uh, the fork twigs and sticks actually get a, give the nest some of its strength. So the the nest height ranges anywhere from one to 17 meters, but averages around six meters. The nest dimension uh, ranges from six uh, from nine to 20 centimeters in diameter and four to 12 centimeters deep. Uh, the gray horned owl is the largest owl and only large North American owl with ear tufts. Uh, we do have a long-eared owl, but it's considered a medium-sized owl, so I guess it doesn't quite fit in this category. Um, so the gray horned owl has these enormous yellow eyes that allow them to hunt for prey at night. Uh, they have a, a facial disc that's outlined with dark feathers, and the neck and throat uh, give them appearance give them an appearance of wearing a bib. Uh, their back and wings are modeled with brown and black on a gray on a gray background, and their belly is whitish with dark horizontal lines. Um, their song is the quintessential owl song with a low booming hoo repeated four to five times. Uh, the female also sings, but uh, it is generally higher pitched than the male. I'll take a moment to share a few interesting facts about how awesome great horned owls are. They have a disjunct population separated by the Amazon rainforest. This South American population is referred to as the great horned owl Magellanic population. Their overall behavior and identification features are similar to the northern great horned owl, however. Uh, another interesting feature or uh, interesting fact are that females uh, will hold egg temperatures at 37 degrees Celsius, even if the ambient temperature outside is 70 degrees colder. Uh, they also have extremely strong talons, which takes a force of 13 kilograms to open. Uh, to get a sense of how strong that is, that would be the equivalent of uh, uh, trying to open a, uh, or the, the equivalent to the bite from a German shepherd. 
So the great horned owls, they're uh, very early egg layers with a very brief breeding season. Uh, in Ontario, they begin laying their eggs mid-February and incubation ends mid to late March. And that's why it's so important for that female to hold the egg temperature at 37 degrees uh, 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 during incubation. So the owlet nestlings, they'll begin hatching late March and all young uh, will have fledged a month later in late April. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if any of you noticed, but I'm sure uh, I've seen on many naturalists and bird group uh, social media pages that uh, I'm seeing a lot of photos of, of young great horned owl nests uh, right now. Um, so because of their distribution across North America, they have a wide variety of habitats to nest, including deciduous mixed and conifer forests. They prefer open and secondary growth temperate woodlands, uh, swamps, orchards, and agricultural areas. Uh, the overall nest site habitat are as equally uh, variable as their landscape habitat preferences, but most nest sites are in trees and snags. They are secondary stick and cavity nesters. Uh, through most of its range, they rely on abandoned stick nests of birds of prey, most commonly red-tailed hawks and other hawks, as well as nests of crows, ravens, herons, and even squirrels. Um, I'll, I'll kind of refer you to the, you know, the red-tailed hawks and the crow and the raven and the heron for nest dimensions and height, uh, as well as some habitat features as well. So the, their stick nests are usually only used for one season, and that's because uh, the, uh, the great horned owls, they don't refurbish their nests and by the end of the breeding period, the nest is completely deteriorated. Uh, they have natural cavities are used for, um, uh, natural cavities are used more often, uh, and the cavities uh, nests are in dead, broken off snags and tree bowls in which the top has been destroyed. So who best to finish off uh, this webinar with than, uh, than with the, uh, the awesome bald eagle? I don't think I'll go over, I don't think I need to go over too many ID features of this bird. I think most people recognize a bald eagle. I'll just point out some key things really quickly. They're the second largest bird of prey in North America next to the California condor. Uh, of course, that white head and, and white tail with dark body and wings are the distinctive features. Um, and uh, something often overlooked are, is that light edging uh, uh, of the feathers on their, on their back. Uh, their weight ranges anywhere from three to six and a half kilograms and the females are 25% larger than the males. Um, it takes a bald eagle four to five years to reach maturity, meaning they will not breed until they are at least four years old. This is one of the main reasons why this species is so affected by pesticides like DDT. Uh, not only did the pesticide cause females to lay in viable eggs, but at any nests that were successful, um, that young bird um, that young bird would take four years before it could even reproduce. So, uh, uh, bald eagles only lay about one or two eggs, only lay one or two eggs a year. So, if you can imagine that uh, um, taking four years, a long uh, a long, uh, sorry, a long uh, time before you can reproduce, as well as the inviable eggs, it's no doubt that their population took such a hit as it did uh, because of DDT. Um, so anyway, during this time, they go through these various molts before they acquire this, that very distinctive uh, uh, white head and tail uh, commonly seen in bald eagles. Um, the graphic pictured here is actually taken from nesting bald eagles in Alaska, uh, but the dates are relatively similar for Ontario. So the eggs are laid in late March to early April, and they'll finish incubation late May to early June. The nestlings hatch late April to early May and fledge in late August to early September. And because they're such a large bird, it takes the young nearly four months to fledge from the nest. Um, the nest tree is usually in the largest uh, super canopy tree available with access to limbs that will support the nest. The nest tree will provide good flight access and visibility to the surrounding area. They will use any type of tree, but tree selection depends on the dominant tree species of the forest, and the nest is constructed just below the crown of the tree. Uh, their preferred tree species are pine, spruce, and firs in northern Ontario, and pine in southern Ontario, but they will nest in oak, hickory, and poplars in southern Ontario if conifers are not available. The male and female contribute to the construction of the nest, but it's the female that places the sticks on uh, 
on the large branches that are attached to the bowl of the tree. Uh, these sticks are selected from the ground or, and broken off nearby trees, and they're placed in an interwoven pattern. And those, are, those sticks are continuously uh, placed and replaced during the breeding season. Uh, they use grass, moss, and other fine materials to fill in, to fill in the gaps near the cup. And so the nest building can take up to three months to complete, but they can also complete a nest in three day in four days if, if they're in a hurry. Uh, nest type really depends on the canopy of the surrounding forests. In Ontario, uh, the nest trees averaged about 28 meters in height and about 28 centimeters in diameter. There's really no mistaking when you come across a bald eagle's nest, they are the largest nest of all birds in the world. The nest dimensions are one and a half to two meters in diameter and are about half a meter to 1.2 meters in height. Uh, an interesting bald eagle nest fact is a, uh, a nest in Ohio. It was used for 34 consecutive years. It measured at the end, it measured 2.7 meters in diameter and 3.6 meters high and estimated to weigh almost two metric tons. Um, so this concludes the stick and cavity nest of the identification portion of this webinar. I would like to take a moment to provide the resources you, that I used for this webinar. So all photos were taken from, from eBird and the Macaulay Library of Images. Uh, credit was given unless they were personal photos. All species information was taken from the Birds of the World website unless otherwise stated. Um, most breeding period information was taken from Birds Canada's nesting calendar query tool um, through Project Nestwatch and filtered to only include Ontario breeding periods. Uh, breeding periods will depend, uh, I think I've mentioned this a few times, but they will depend and vary depend, uh, on geography and environment. Um, excuse me, most of this information is produced by the, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, of which Birds Canada is a partner. I'd also like uh, to thank you so much for joining this webinar. I hope the information I provided is useful. Um, I, again, as whether you're using it as for personal knowledge and interest or, uh, or just becoming a better steward for your woodlot. And last but certainly not least, a very special thank you to the OWA board and management team for not only, recognize, uh, not only organizing and advertising this webinar, but for also encouraging bird conservation in woodlots through Ontario. Uh, it is through private land ownership where the real impact for birds and other wildlife conservation has the most potential.